hi Debbie, welcome to Ultra Runner magazine. Hi, how are you today? I'm good, thanks you. Great, thanks, great. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so let's just jump straight into it. How was bad water? <laughs> Oh my goodness, that was quick. Um, it was insane, is probably the only way I could describe it. Um, yeah, it was everything I expected it to be and more. Um, obviously it was very hot, but that's why you sign up for bad water. Um, yeah, it wasn't without its challenges. Um, but now I'm a few weeks down the line, I have forgotten all the bad bits. So I can only say it was an amazing experience and I loved every bit of it. Uh, my crew would probably tell you a different story, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that I got to experience it. I'm so glad that I got to finish it. Um, but yeah, it still feels uh, pretty surreal. Okay. Um, so what separates bad water to other races you've done in the past? Oh my goodness. There's, <laughs> there's many, many, many different reasons why. Um, first of all, it's the first race I've ever done in the States. So I've done a lot of races in the UK and in Europe, but that's the furthest the field I've ever been to race. Um, and uh, I have done a race in Greece, which was around about mid thirties. And that's probably the hottest that I've ever experienced for race conditions. So um, yeah, it was by far the most challenging conditions that I've ever had to deal with. Um, and it was challenging because it's not anything I've experienced or anything that I could train in. So it was way out of my comfort zone because it's just a whole new experience for me. Um, and uh, it's, it's different because of the way that you work with your crew. Um, it's very much a team event. Um, so you see your crew every mile, two miles, whereas I'm used to being quite self-sufficient and out for quite a long time um, with everything that I need packed on my back. Um, so yeah, probably the heat, the crew makes it like totally different than anything else I've ever experienced. Was there anything you could do to kind of adjust to the heat over here or did you just go, <laughs> did you acclimatise at all? Yeah, well, I had to get quite creative because I live in Glasgow and I think one day we we hit the dizzy heights of about 19 degrees of course the heat wave started as soon as we had left so it would have been nice to have that a few weeks of that but unfortunately I was kind of going on the basis that I wouldn't get any sort of hot weather um in the UK or anything close to what I would experience in Death Valley so um I trained in a heat chamber uh, out at one of the local universities um I did a few sessions in there um, I spent a lot of time sitting in saunas. Um, I joined uh, David Lloyd um, just because I knew they had a really hot sauna. Um, so I sat in there for many hours a week, um, having very strange conversations. And um, I kind of built a, a kind of makeshift DIY heat chamber in my garage. Um, so I had a treadmill already. So I kind of cordoned off or put some plastic tarpaulin which I bought from Amazon um, and kind of blocked off uh, the bottom of the garage and put in a few heat heat van heaters in there um, and I could get that up to about 38 degrees um, so yeah I did quite a lot of hours of running on a treadmill with fan heaters blowing at me while staring out the back window of the garage and um, it wasn't pleasant <laughs> but it was effective um, and I guess I just had to get creative um, I knew the heat was going to be my biggest issue in the race, as it is for most people. Um, but for me, especially because it's not something that I get to run in, even in the height of the summer. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was not ideal preparation. It would have been great to be out in California for a month before it. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't. So I just had to make do with what I had. And uh, yeah, it was OK. It worked out OK. It, did, it was the best that I could. Um, but yeah, it wasn't pleasant, but it was definitely effective. What was the temperature whilst you were out there? Uh, it hit for about 51. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so <laughs> in the evening, or well, late in the evening when the race starts, there is um, one of the first checkpoints, which is Furnace Creek. And that's kind of like the main touristy bit. So it's got like a massive big thermometer and people can get their picture taken with it. So the sun was setting and it was still 47 degrees um so yeah it doesn't drop very very low that's for sure 
Um, but there is three mountain passes that you go over. So the higher up you go, it does get a little bit more manageable, but manageable in comparison to previously running in 50 degrees, not manageable yeah. for a Scottish person. <laughs> Not like in England and Scotland where you have to put layers on when you get up because it gets really cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was kind of it's really nice to have a little bit of fresh air. But there's also quite, um, it's a really hot wind when you're out there as well. And, and, well, fortunately for us, it wasn't there the whole time in the race, but I know in previous years, they've had a really hot wind, which um, people described it as running with a hair dryer in your face. And I can concur, it is indeed running, like running with a hair dryer in your face. So, um, yeah, I'm not selling it to you here, am I? I know, yeah. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure there was any chance that I was ever going to do, but there's definitely not now. <laughs> never say never, that's what I say. <laughs> um, so for anyone that doesn't really know much about Badwater, could you tell us a bit about the race and the course? Yeah, so it's quite an iconic race. So um, I've been running ultras for 15 years, and um, it's one of those ones that I've always heard about. You know, it's infamous for various reasons um uh, there's not that many people who have done it I think one of the stats um is more people have climbed Everest than have completed Badwater which is quite an interesting stat and it's not really because people don't want to do it because they do have you know an influx of applicants every year uh, and I'm guessing it grows every year as well because yeah there's more ultra runners in the sport it's just it's probably high up in a lot of people's bucket list because it is one of the most famous ones. It's one of the most iconic ones. It's one that's always talked about in all the ultra running books. Um, so, yeah, it starts in Badwater Basin, which is below sea level. Um, which is kind of weird because, like, I remember uploaded my run and, like, Strava doesn't quite know what to do with, <laughs> your, <laughs> with your elevation because it's just a little squiggle. It's like, what's going on here? Um, so it starts below sea level um, and it runs through Death Valley and finishes in the portal, the trailhead of Mount Whitney, um, which is uh, it's in California. So, um yeah, I think there's about 15,000 feet of climbing. It's all on road. Um, yeah, and it's mostly going through Death Valley and it's mostly just dealing with really hot temperatures. Because um, even when it's dark, it's still really hot. But um, yeah, so that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> but they only, they only I, will, I say invite, they only select 100 people to do it every year. They're really curtailed by how many people can actually run the race because there's so many um, uh, organizations and bodies that have a say in whether this race can go ahead because it's part of the national park. Um, so yeah, they're only allowed a hundred people in the race every year. So yeah, I was super lucky to be asked to come along. So yeah, I had to make the most of the experience. Yeah. You've got the years of experience behind you anyway. Yeah, I mean, when I was training for it, because I do have a lot of miles in my legs and I've done a lot of mountain races and trail races. Um, so I didn't have to focus on getting miles and ascent because um, I'd already had that. And uh, because I was pushing myself out of my comfort zone and you're out of your comfort zone because you've just not experienced that um, or you've not trained or prepped for what you're going to face with on race day. So I used pretty much most of my time just focusing on heat adaptation um so when I was doing my run really long and had a lot of ascent in it so I already had that training in the bank um but my biggest weak weakness was always going to be the heat so when I'm going into a race which is completely new for me I like to focus on my weakness um just to almost give that a little bit more balance and the challenges that I'm going to have to face um so yeah, everything I did was just focusing on the heat. And then in terms of nutrition, how did you plan for that? Because obviously I know it's a lot different to UK races where you're carrying a lot of the equipment for yourself. How do you, you plan nutrition for a race that long? Yeah, I am pretty rubbish at eating in races. <laughs> um, I always have been. Um, so my plan, I didn't really plan on eating an awful lot because I knew I wouldn't. When you factor in those temperatures and the digestion issues you're going to have of running in those temperatures, 
almost like the food was a backup. Um, so I only bought things like sweets and nuts and I had a couple of wraps and it was more like a backup. If the possibility arose that I might be able to eat, I would have them. But I was mostly using liquids and um, gels. But when we started at night, um, I think, you know, you just you have to take on so much liquid because you're constantly thirsty uh, and your mouth's really dry with that. That heat just basically dries out everything. Um, so I was really quite sick um, from about 22 miles for a good 10, 15 miles. So everything I'd taken in, I basically left on the side of the road and did for quite some time. Um, and for thereafter, I could only really take in liquids. Um, and uh, there was a lot, I would try to have a gel and it was almost like a gag trigger and then I would be sick again. So, um, yeah, I didn't really take in. Look, looking back now, I have literally no idea how I finished that race <laughs> on what I was consuming. Because what I was consuming, <laughs> what I was um, uploading and uh, what was staying in doesn't really... Wanted to race. I wanted to take in more liquid fuels, um, but unfortunately, that's just the way it panned out. I mean, a lot of people are sick in the race. I think it's a rite of passage that you've got to be sick on Death Valley somewhere. Um, but yeah, it's not uncommon for me to be sick, but I've never been that sick. Okay. Oh, I mean, you're not really selling the race. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> what was what was one of the highlights of the race for you then? Oh, the views, like Death Valley is absolutely stunning. Um, and I was so surprised at how beautiful it was because um, I expected it to be like arid and desolate and really mundane. And I expected the route to be quite boring. Um, but the views are amazing. And uh, the colours and the different landscape that you go through um it's it's just beautiful it's really lovely and although it's just a road with a white line it's like a beautiful road with a white line <laughs> um but the people are amazing in the race as well and it's got that nice small community spirit around the race as well because like ultra running has really boomed in the last five ten years and what um for the reasons that I fell in love with the sport was because of the camaraderie and it was almost like a niche sport and everybody knew everybody Whereas now you're going on to races and there's literally thousands of people and it's really busy and really noisy. Um, so it was nice just to go back to, I don't want to say it's a low key event because it's not, um, but it's nice just to go back and have that community and a small amount of people round about you. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, so they were definitely the highlights, the views, the people, the people out on the course, like other people's crews, like, it's it's hard to it's not really a competitive event. Uh, I guessing if you're going out to win, then um, it does become really competitive. But everyone's really rooting for each other, and you know, like other crews are helping you out and really, you know, cheering you on. Um, so yeah, and, it, and when I say like there's only a hundred people that are allowed in the race, and the race director basically it has the freedom to select who he wants in the race and it's not about who's the fastest or who's the most elite or who's going to turn this into like a really competitive race and um, it's just about who he thinks can actually complete it in the race like the dnf rate is really quite low considering what people are faced with in the race um, and i think that's because you know, they're really selective about who is allowed to get on the start line, but also people are really prepped, you know, they're really prepared for the task in hand. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the DNF rate is like maybe eight to 10 every year, which is really not that high um, for a race because that could just be an injury or timed out at one of the, the checkpoints. Um, and people are just really prepped for it. So everyone works really hard to get there. And there's a lot of uh, repeat offenders. So there's a lot of people who go back year on year. And I think the more that you do that and the more you experience it, 
um, the more you can deal with things, situations which arise during the race. That's because I know hard. if I went back to do it, I would, you know, I would do things different. I'm not going back to do it. I'm just saying that. I was right just going to say, would you, would you do it again? <laughs> no, I mean, I wouldn't do it again because it was an amazing experience. Um, I'm really glad that I got to do that. Um, but. Yeah, it's a massive undertaking, and not just for me personally, but also for my family, because like we were all out there for two weeks, and it's not the cheapest race to do. I think it's probably cheaper to go up Everest. Um, but um, no, I I can't see me going back anytime soon. And it's not because I didn't enjoy it or I didn't love the experience. I did. Um, but yeah, I, I can't see me at this time going back to do it. But it's a big commitment, isn't it? Like it's. it's huge commitment and there's so many other things that I want to do and um, yeah I don't think I could drag my husband and my son back out to Death Valley as much as they love that it's hard going it's hard going for the crew it's harder for the crew than it is for the runner so how many people do you did you have for a crew uh, I had four you're allowed four in total uh, my 13 year old son was there as well I wouldn't really count him as crew but you've got to account them for everybody that's in the car so you'd only allowed one support car uh, and four crew members at any point. So I had uh, my husband, Marco, who's obviously crewed for me many times, my friend Susie, and then there was a local chap um, who was looking for a runner to help. Um, that's another thing about the community. Like people are desperate to crew on the race. Um, a lot of people want to crew because it gets them earn their stripes so that they can enter. Um, for years after but James just really wanted to come out and help out the race and um, so I had those three um, and they got on so well and they had a great time so they were just amazing from start to finish. Um, he's quite nice because I think quite a lot of races these days pride themselves on high uh, DNF rates and being like a really tough challenge and obviously it's a really tough challenge but it sounds like it's more important that everyone has a nice time and is prepared for the race as opposed to just it being the hardest race ever. Hello. You're on mute. Hello. Hi. We're not having a good time here. Are we? Oh, I'm fine. Um, I don't know what just happened then. Let's try that again. Right, sad. Go back. <laughs> so I think you were saying something about races priding themselves on their DNF rates. Yeah, I was just yeah, I was just saying that a lot of races like to show the toughest race around and have high DNF rates. And even though this is obviously a really hard race, it seems to be more about having races that are prepared for it and like enjoying the community spirit which is nice. Yeah, so I'm not really into this, everyone calling themselves the toughest and the world's most hard race and all that, but um, the Badwater does call, call itself the world's toughest race. <laughs> and I can confirm <laughs> it is probably one of the world's toughest races, um, but it's all relative really. You know, it's um, it was really tough for me because the conditions were just, so far removed from anything that I've ever trained or ran in. Um, but maybe if you took some of those Californians and stuck them on the spine in January, then they might have the same issues that I had out in Death Valley. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, of, I, I hear what you're saying. There is a lot of races that almost use that as their, their marketing tool, you know, like the, the DNF rate or the success rate. And it's almost like a badge of honor saying you know 60 percent dnf because yeah i think it is it does attract people to that race the dnfs because people do like to challenge themselves 
Um, and I do like races that have quite a low success rate. Um, I'm quite attracted and motivated to races like that. Um, I'm quite, um, I like races that scare me. Um, I like doing things that give me the fear, um, mainly because it makes me prep for it as well. And I like going away and doing my homework. Um, and it was nice doing something like Badwater because I have been running for like 20 years. Um, and it meant that I did have to go and do my homework. And, you know, I watched a lot of YouTube videos and read blogs and race reports, loads of reports on heat training. Um, I had a ring binder folder. That's how serious I was taking my preparation. <laughs> um, it's packed with stuff that I'd printed and clips about Badwater, Death Valley, about the route about heat acclimatization and um so it was actually nice to go back and do some homework and not just have to focus on churning out miles and it's, there's just so much prep that goes into races like this and it does yeah. it's, not, it's not just about running is it no and because i hadn't really been there i almost had to learn it all remotely so it wasn't like i could just go out and do a recce in the course and understand various sections you know so i had to do it all virtually um, but when we got there um we stayed in vegas from the tuesday and then drove out to death valley on the saturday so we actually drove the whole length of the course on the way to lone pine which is where all the race registration is and then just did a kind of a short loop up to mount whitney and back um so it was really nice to actually see the course and the car with air conditioning. <laughs> uh, so uh, and it was so beautiful and I was so pleasantly surprised that actually just um, it took away any nerves and just kind of replaced that with excitement. Um, so, yeah, it would have been nice to have been out there and actually run on the course. But c'est la vie. I had to learn from about it from my ring binder folder. It sounds like you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what would you recommend for anyone that's considering doing the race or wants to think about doing it in the future yeah I mean I guess you've got to earn your stripes um because it's not just a case of like entering and wishing that your name gets drawn out of a hat because that's just not the way it works in Badwater and like other races you know like western states where you put in an application and you get x amount of tickets and they roll over and double in the year after and then eventually you know, if the gods are on your side, your name gets drawn out. Um, but with Badwater, it's different. So um, I think, you know, if anyone's thinking about doing it, just go out and crew on the race, you know, just go on the Facebook group, say to them that you're looking for crew. It's probably not ideal race entry process if you live in the UK, because you've got to get out to California. But it depends how serious you are about doing it. Um, or, you know, just get yourself a nice CV or application form. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you've got to apply. If they don't let you in, they don't let you in. But if you want to get in, um, yeah, just get out there and do some races so you've got a nice CV. They do have races that they do as qualifying races, but they're not imperative. But there is a few races on there that your application, they might look favorably. If you have done some of those UK races, um, I'm not quite sure of what the um, the selection policy or criteria or how the whole process works, but um, yeah, uh, getting out there on the course and crewing, I think, would um, definitely put you in for contention should you ever want to get a place in it. It would just be a good experience as well, wouldn't it? You get to see the course. Well, do you know, but that's huge because I was so thankful that two of my crew members, Susie and James, had crewed before because having that experience is invaluable because although Marco's crewed for me and he knows how to deal with me on a personal level, how to actually crew on that race is just like, it's worlds apart from what we've ever experienced before, you know, just like how to pack the car how to deal with ice to stop it from melting, you know, how to get to keep the drinks cool, how to organise the car, where to buy stuff, where to get petrol, all those things that um, you really need to do your research or have someone that's been out in the race before. And I was quite adamant that I wanted someone who's had race experience out there. Um, and it just made a world of a difference. OK, what's next for you now you've done bad water? Gosh, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I keep thinking I'm running out of things to do. Um, 
I really want to get into Western States. Um, I've been trying to get into that race for five years. Uh, I haven't been lucky enough in the draw. But I know, uh, I know I'll get in there one day, so I'm not bothered about that. Um, I'll just keep trying until they eventually have to pull my name out that proverbial <laughs> hat. Um, so, uh, yeah, I really wanted to do Western States um, this year. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get in, but I'm kind of glad I didn't because it meant I got to do the spine race again, um, which I wouldn't have done if I'd got Western States because it just takes too long to recover from. Um, so I'm so glad that I got to do the spine this year and uh, I got to apply for Badwater, which wasn't really anything that was on my radar until after I'd finished the spine race. Um, and I thought, because I'd won the spine race, I thought, well, that kind of gives me a little bit of more credibility on my CV. Um, I'm pretty sure I only got into bad water because I had won the spine race because the race director was following it. Um, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'm shameless. I'll okay. take anything. Um, so I was really glad that I got to do the things that I got, was, um, that I got to experience this year. Um, you know, it's just things just work out the way they're meant to be. and. Uh, you know, I trust that. Um, but I am going to do the arc down on the South Coast Path in January. Um, because I don't like doing races with nice conditions, do I? I like to focus <laughs> myself into um kind of the summer like a normal person. Um so I'm really looking forward to that. I'm gonna hopefully try and get down there for a weekend at the end of the summer because I know it's a really beautiful route. Um and I want to at least have a couple of days out enjoying it um in daylight. So I'm going to do that and then uh, I think I'm going to do Cape Wrath, which is an eight-day challenge that goes up to the north of Scotland in May. Um, yeah, and that's as far as I've got. There's that's many, so many races. <laughs> I know that's like the most organised I've ever been. <laughs> um, there's loads of races that I want to do, but I try to only do a few every year. Uh, you know, in the last 12 months, I've done Lakeland 100, the Autumn 100, the Spine and Badwater. And that's a lot for me in 12 months. Um, it's a lot for anyone in 12 months. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to a little bit of downtime and then just see if I can get my mountain legs moving again so that um, all those steps on the coast path aren't as arduous. Um, as everyone makes them out to be. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Next year is going to be really exciting, but I'm just uh, I'm just focusing on recovering just now because I do feel a bit battered. Um, like I didn't have any doms after the race and we went to holiday, well, we went to LA the day after. And as soon as we got to the hotel, I was like, right, let's go touristing. Um, and I thought, <laughs> yeah, I thought my legs would be, I thought I expected to have a lot of swelling um, because of the heat and, um, you know, just battering your feet on tarmac for 135 miles. And I didn't really, I had a little bit. Um, so there's things that I expected to happen, like swelling and chafing and blisters. And I didn't have any of that. I didn't have any domes, really. Kind of like, I mean, I wasn't moving <laughs> smoothly. Um, but I think just getting to LA and just moving around and just there was so much we wanted to do over the few days that we were there. So I just had to suck it up and get on with it. Um, but yeah, I do I do still feel some underlying fatigue that's probably going to hang for a few weeks. Um, and that's fine. That's fine. Oh, well, um, I'm sure you'll recover very soon. You'll be back out there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm running. It's just not pretty. <laughs> Um, well, best of luck with the races that you've got planned, and hopefully we'll get yes. you back on after those as well. But it's been lovely chatting to you, Debbie. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and have a lovely evening. <laughs>